How many of y'all have enjoyed our time talking about some of these issues the past couple of weeks when it comes to relationships and marriage? And actually, the last couple of weeks, we've found ourselves talking a good bit about uh, being single and preparing yourself uh, for marriage and that sort of thing. So if you've missed the last couple of weeks and you're single, any single people in the room? Yeah, if you're single, hopefully you've been here the past couple of weeks, you caught some of that. Um, but if you didn't catch it, you can, you can go on our podcast, our app and all that, uh, YouTube and all that. And, uh, I know that it'll help you. I do have a, a, something for you, kind of a joke to get things started. Is that okay, babe? And, um, I don't know if you've heard of the five love languages. Have you ever heard of the five love languages, you know, acts of service and physical touch and all that kind of stuff. All right. So, um, this is kind of an updated version of that, uh, the five love languages. One, acts of service. Um, I made you some tacos. Two, um, one, another five, uh, one of the five love languages. Words of affirmation. Your tacos are delicious. Three, quality time. Let's go out for tacos tonight. Four, receiving gifts. Here's a taco. <laughs> We're going to get some meteor on the way out of church tonight. Um, number five, physical touch. Let me hold you like a taco. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty good. <laughs> um, all right. So tonight we want to cover some things, uh, that could be called a lot of things, but you know, essentially it's, you know, relationship essentials and understanding men and women and different needs that they may have in the context of marriage, but it'll ring true, you know, to some degree beyond just marriage, you know, maybe understanding, uh, your, in your kids or, or men, women in general. And so, um, I'll give just, uh, one or two verses of scripture, and then we'll jump into this. And this is first Peter three and verse seven, first Peter three and verse seven. It just says, husbands dwell with them talking about your wife with understanding. First Peter three, seven, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Um, that word understanding just means knowledge, you know, having knowledge or, or understanding. So, uh, it's important that we have understanding or have knowledge concerning, um, if you're married concerning your wife, um, if your husband, for your wife, if you're a wife, you want understanding concerning your husband, that you know them and understand them, the makeup of, of who they are, what makes them tick, what their desires are, what their needs are, that sort of thing. And that will help you uh, thrive in your relationship if you have greater understanding of them and what they need. In Proverbs four in verse five, it says, get wisdom, get understanding. Uh, do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she'll preserve you. Love her. She will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom and all you're getting, get understanding. So we all need some wisdom. We all need, um, some understanding. Amen. And so one of the things that encouraged me, I heard this guy preaching about, you know, this is probably early on, maybe when we were first married, um, or maybe even leading up to that, you know, and uh, he was talking about, uh, your wife, you know, understanding your wife. And he said, you don't have to understand all women. You just have to understand the one you got. And there's some liberty in that too. It's like, you know, you can never understand all women. Well, maybe that that's true to some degree, but if, if, you know, if you married one and you're living with her, you should figure out a few things pretty quick. You know what I'm saying? And there should be some conversations, some understanding along the way. And so I believe, um, you probably got some of that, but I believe the Lord to help us, uh, through tonight and what we share tonight. Um, to get more of that tonight. And so we're going to kind of go back and forth. I'm going to share some, uh, one thing and she's going to share one thing. Do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? Um, I I'll go first then. Is that okay? Because this is kind of where we ended up a little bit, uh, last, last week. And so this was what you would call a, a mega need for a man, a mega need for a man. And uh, this is to me, this would be across the board, even an understanding if you're raising a son, understanding kind of a little bit, his heart and what makes him tick and what matters to him. And that mega need would be honor. Um, it's the key to, uh, a man's heart. 
uh, I have it in my notes this way, a son's heart, a husband's heart, father's heart, that sort of thing. And even though we live in a society that's a supremely dishonoring society, you know, and if you watch the, the, the TV shows or Netflix or whatever it is, all that, that kind of depict a family and the makeup of it, there's a lot of dishonor um, across the board. Um, a lot of dishonor for parents and a lot of dishonor from uh, a wife to a husband. And it's funny and it's, when you're watching, it's funny and it's like, ah, you know, he's stupid. He don't know what he's doing and he's, you know, daddy's just this and, you know, and it's just dishonorable. Um, but the key to uh, unlocking a man's heart is not going to be making fun of him or talking down to him or treating him disrespectfully, but it's going to be honor and respect toward him. You could say it this way, honor is oxygen in his tank. Honor is uh, oxygen in his tank and a man will gravitate to the place where he has the most honor. A man will gravitate to the place where he has the most honor. And so there needs to be honor at the house, certainly. But you can see why maybe a, a man would particularly be, would gravitate to a place where there's honor in the workplace, where he's treated well, talked to well, where he's, I like this place because people treat me with a certain level of respect and honor. But to come home and to get none there, you can see why there may be a reason why he would be like, I don't want to go home and be disrespected at the house when I can at least, if I'm at least if I'm at the job, they're going to treat me right, talk to me right, and be respected respectful to me. Are y'all with me in this? Yeah. Amen. And so there's a few ways that you can honor. Um, and this is, you know, going to sound one way or the other, but allowing him to fail is, it sounds funny, but he's going to make mis mistakes, but uh, giving him the space, uh, to, uh, to, to miss it every now and then uh, any woman can honor the perfect man, but you need to honor him whether he deserves it or not. Boy, I got no amen right there. Another part of that, honor him where you want him to be, not where he is. The best way to get your husband's attention is by honor. The best way to change your husband is by honor. The best way to get your husband to spend more time with you is by honor because it's the deepest need and it's, the most, it's your most powerful asset. So you, the, the greatest way to get his attention is not the nagging, it's not the whining, it's not being like rah, rah, rah. Honor is the key to getting his attention. Another part to that, cover his faults and reflect his strengths cover his fault and reflect his strengths. Let him know that, that you, uh, that you can, that he can trust you and honor him and cover his, cover his faults. Amen. So that's, that's one. So I know y'all are all taking notes and didn't get a lot of, I didn't get a lot of amens on that, but it's absolutely the truth. Amen. Do I have an amen from the fellas in the house? Thank you. As my father-in-law leaves right now, so that's a bad time to walk out. <laughs> that's a bad time to walk out. Pastor Cody. Okay. Um, well, for my part, I'm going to give you three, I guess they are needs, but I believe they're also desires of women in their marriages. But I think these kind of flow over into every relationship. I think everything we've given you the past few weeks is not just for a marriage or a relationship, but any relationship in your life, these things work because it's Bible-based, it's scriptural, and God really gave us the tools to build relationships that are lifelong because that's what he wants. But before we get into the number one we need of a woman, I wanted to share this with you that the single most important issue in every single marriage will always be this, our personal relationship with Jesus. That's going to matter more than the perfect spouse. It's what is his relationship with Jesus look like and what does my relationship with Jesus look like? Because only God can meet our deepest needs. And there's four needs that all humans have and they're this acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. Everyone in the room can say, that's what I want. Acceptance, identity. I want to be accepted by the people I'm surrounded with. I want to know who I am. I need security in this life and I want to know my purpose. And the truth is when we get married, if we don't have a close relationship with Jesus, the only one who can meet those four needs, then we're going to just automatically transfer our expectation to our spouse and you have set this thing up for disaster. 
Like if I don't know that I'm accepted by Jesus first, there is nothing he'll be able to do to give me that acceptance. If I don't know who I am in Christ, then no matter how much he tries to pump me up, it will never be enough. No matter how much he tries to give me security, I won't understand it because my first security has to come from Jesus. My purpose comes from Jesus, so I can't look to him first for my purpose. I gotta find all that in Jesus. And so just understand this, your spouse can never be and was never meant to be Jesus for you. They are not your savior, they're not your helper, they're not your standby, they're not your intercessor, they're not the Holy Ghost, they're your partner. And so, um, you remember the example of in the New Testament when Jesus went to the, to the well to draw water and there's the Samaritan woman there and um, Jesus began to speak to her and he began to tell her everything about herself and he asked about her husband and she said, well, sir, I don't have a husband. And he said, you're right, you have five and the one you're with now isn't your husband either. And we read that story and we're like, there's so many things you can get from it, but the truth is, what was this woman doing? She was just going from relationship to relationship looking for acceptance and identity and security and she couldn't find it until the day she met Jesus. And the day she met Jesus, everything changed for her. She became the first woman evangelist, I'm telling you, like went and told the whole city about Jesus and everything changed. And so understand this for marriage. If we could meet our own needs, we would not need to get married. If we were all so self-sufficient, we don't need to be married, but we get married for this purpose. We wanna meet one another's needs. That means I have to know what you need and I have to desire to want to be a person that meets that need for you. And because men and women have different like built in core needs, we have to realize I cannot meet my own need. And so when there is a bad marriage or problems in marriage, it usually means that one or both are kind of rejecting the other's inherent differences in life. And so when you are married, understand this. I we say we know this, like men and women are different, but when we are married, sometimes we pretend like we don't know that. Like, I don't know why he just doesn't say it the way I say it, because he's not a woman. And why she just doesn't understand it the way I'm, I'm understanding it, because she's not a man. And how boring would it be if we didn't have to learn this about each other. So these are three needs, I'll give you one here, needs of a wife, and then I wanna add on how to understand them because I think we need some help in these areas. Number one is security. Number, ne number one need of a woman is security. These are just some real simple dictionary definitions of security. One means freedom from danger, risk, or risk. Another means freedom from care, anxiety, or doubt a well-founded confidence. It also means something that secures or makes safe. It's like a, it's a protection or a defense. Freedom from financial cares or want. Precautions taken to guard against crime or attack. Or protection or precaution taken against escape. Meaning, I wanna know you're gonna stick with me. I wanna know you're here. It also just means an insurance or a guarantee. So a number one need for women is security. What is that? I want to feel protected. I wanna feel safe. I wanna feel secure with you. I don't wanna have anxiety and doubts about whether or not you're gonna stick around. Women need that, they desire that. And in Ephesians 5.25, it's real simple. It says this, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So we have real simply a biblical standard that is a wife is to respect her husband the same way she would respect Jesus. So wives, we have to ask ourselves: if Jesus came to visit my house, would I talk to him the way I'm talking to my husband? Would I treat him the way I'm treating my husband? Would I prepare this home the way I would prepare it for Jesus to visit because my husband's coming home? I don't mean be crazy and go all whatever, but you know, women, what I'm talking about when I say, if you knew Jesus was coming, you'd get ready. You'd wanna be the best host. And so it, it means that for a wife and for a husband, it means to give your life for her the same way Jesus gave his life for you. So we find out that to love her, 
more than you love yourself would be the example that Jesus gave us. You're willing to sacrifice for her. And so there are three quick ways you can meet your wife's need for security. Number one is communicate your commitment to sacrifice to her. And I know sometimes men don't always get this, but women like you to tell, you, tell them what you need, but they also like to hear that you hear them. Right, ladies? Do you like to be heard? Do you like to be understood? Do you like to feel like somebody's listening? So what this really boils down to is a wife needs to know that nothing else is important to you as she is. Um, so you're saying like, I should say that. Yeah. Yeah. You can say it. What should I say again? Nothing is as important to me Nothing as you. Nothing is as important to me as you. You want to hear those Thank words. You very Women much. want to hear those they words. They do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that we sometimes think, well, men just like to hear words, but that's crazy. Who has more words? We have more words. We like words. Words are how we live life and how we identify and how we communicate. So, so nothing should be as important. So that means you're going to have to, again, be willing to take the example of Jesus and sacrifice. Well, what can I sacrifice to show she's most important? Just pick one, buddy. An interest, a hobby, a friend, an event, an opportunity, a, a promotion, anything that would make her feel that she is not less important than that. I'm not saying you can't do anything else. Aaron does all kinds of things he likes to do, and I'm, I'm glad about that. But if there's ever a time where it's like been a rough, whatever, Monday night, and he's like, I'm gonna play basketball with the boys, and I'm like, oh my God. When he says, or do you need me to be here? Thank you for saying that. And almost, in him saying that, just gives me so much security that I am more important. I'm like, go play ball. Do you understand that? Okay. But like, I'm, but I need to mean that. Yeah, mean it. Please don't lie. I mean, One thing I, we really don't like is lying. And then I need you to tell me the truth. The truth about it. Which is like, do you need me to be here? Like, tell me the truth. Yeah. If you're like, yes, I really do. Yeah. Okay, I'll, then that's I'll be fine. There. Yeah. I'll be here. But don't, like, they, the marriage is a lot of games sometimes. Well, it's like, yeah. no, go ahead. I'm like, wait, wait. Slam the door on the way. Which is it? I'm just saying, but no, it's true because I used to do that and I tried to be like, well, I'm going to be a good wife. And then I'd just be mad. And then I'm mad when he gets home. He's like, you told me to go. I'm like, you should have known. <laughs> they don't know. I don't know. They don't know. I need knowledge and understanding. Right. We're working on it. Communicate your sacrifice to her. Number two, be sensitive to your wife's needs and don't make her nag or beg you. Do you know what women don't like to do? Nag. I literally hate it, literally. But if I really need something done, I'm gonna keep asking until it gets done, why? Because I just need it done. For example, don't like garbage. Don't want it in my house. I'm not even one of those fill it to the top before you take it out. Don't care if you think it's wasting a garbage bag. I don't like garbage in the house, it's gross. So if I have to say, can you take the garbage out, which he almost always takes the garbage out but it's still there and then something happened yesterday where I stepped on the garbage lid and went throw something in and something on the top of the lid of the can made my hand wet. Well then I'm gonna be real dramatic and start taking the garbage out myself and doing it real noisy. Why? Because I really didn't want to nag, I just want the garbage out but now I got garbage fingers. So like, you know what I mean. And guys, you know that's like, and crap. Yes screwed up right there because I really forgot and so I'm just saying like be sensitive to her needs and maybe there wouldn't be so much nagging if there was actually some action don't be mad at me I'm just delivering the goods when you do kind things for your wife a phone call a text message that isn't asking her to do things or where are my keys because they're right where you left them you know like or flowers. One thing Aaron does that's so sweet, I mean, not all the time, but sometimes he makes coffee every morning. That blesses my life. And I'm not up as early as him. So once in a while, he'll just write a little sticky note by the coffee, I love you, or a heart. I love it, I keep them, they're all stacked up. It's a good little stack of them. Why? Because you are saying, in the middle of my morning, I'm thinking about you. I'm communicating a quick heart, how long does that take you? One second. 
But I'm like, oh, he thought about me while he was making this coffee. That really helps me. What does it help? It helps me feel secure in his love for me and his attention to me, that he, he is happy that we live in a house together. I don't have to doubt that. And so um, it really just communicates his heart, his thoughts. And when you don't do any of these things or there's a lack of like even small romantic kind of gestures or words, it's really saying, I'm not thinking about you and you're not in my heart. And again, I've heard it said over the years, we've done a lot of marriage counseling. Well, I just don't feel like he thinks about me or that he loves me. He's like, I've already told you I love you. And we'll say, when's the last time? Well, I don't know, but she should know. But girls, listen, we just, men, the the women in your life like to hear it. As much as you do, they like to hear it. And then number three, how to communicate security is be a faithful provider and a faithful money manager. I know in the world we live in, people act like money doesn't matter, but have you ever tried living without it? It's just not true, you need money to live. But I wanna make something very clear. A good woman is not looking for a man that has a big paycheck. A good woman is looking for your commitment to provide and lead financially and be a good manager of the finances that are in the home and always be looking for ways to do better in that area. So it's not the size of the paycheck, it's the size of your commitment to do the right thing with the money that you have. For a woman, that really communicates like you are not just out like spending money that I don't know about and not telling me about because that makes me insecure. Um, I will also add this because we've just recently had questions when it comes to security financially. We're not big fans of like separate accounts. Mm, So quiet, it's a blessing. Why? Because people are sneaky. I'm not saying you can't have like your fun money, whatever. Like we talk about that. Like, hey, here's some money. I got you some money so you can do whatever you want with it. But there needs to be like really clear communication in order for a woman to feel like you are um, willing to be her security in a lot of areas. Like I want you to be my security financially. Well, shouldn't women work too? Sure, if they need to. But that doesn't mean that I want to. This whole like, can I just say it? Yeah, I can. This whole like women, what do we call it? Feminine thing, what do you call that? Feminism. Who did that? Why? I wanna go to work, I don't wanna be, why? I want to be able to do what a man can do. Is that so? How come I don't see any women working construction jobs? Oh boy. You mean I want to get paid the same, I just don't want to have to work as hard. Women don't get mad at me. They, whoever did that really messed it up for us. Because a lot of women, how many women in this room work? I work, I come to the office, I do, yeah. I think it's fine. What I'm saying is just because I have a job doesn't mean I want to have to like depend all on me. I don't want to. You know what I want? I want him to bring home money and pay the bills. Why? It communicates security in my house for me. And the be- one of the best things you can ever do for your kids is have your house be a place of security. It's not about a ton of money, it's about them knowing that I am safe in this house, I am loved in this house, my needs are met in this house, my parents are working together in this house, their marriage is secure, so I'm secure. And it really, it does something in a home that I don't think a lot else can do, so. That's right. We're, we're obviously four women Voting, no doubt, you know voting, that about me. You know, being business That's leader, read Proverbs feminism. thirty-one. You know right. all the stuff yeah. that women can do. Obviously, so my wife is a leader, preacher, pastor, amazing. She's good with money. She's good with a lot of things. And so, anyway, obviously, you know, we're not saying anything like that. But what? <laughs> I still just like it better when you pay the bills. <laughs> <laughs> right. Amen. Woman, do you, I mean, really? Would, do you want a man who's like, you take care of that all? 
Amen. I'll take care of it. He does. <laughs> we'll move on to the men here. Uh, needs, essentials for a man. And I think those, the first ones that we shared are, are what you would call like mega needs, you know, that like top of the list kind of stuff. Um, number two uh, for a man within the context of marriage would be physical intimacy. Um, that's a nice way of saying sex. Um, so while in 20% of women are more sexual than their husbands, typically men are more sexual than women. And so um, while most women recognize this need of like they would acknowledge in like right now, I'd go, yeah, that's right, you know, sure. Um, they would under, uh, understand that many times in marriage, women don't uh, respect it, don't respect it, meaning um, they don't want to meet that need. And they don't want to meet it as much as he wants it. Do you follow what I'm saying right here? And so we're like, well, you know, he doesn't really need it that much. And I was listening to this podcast and they're like, well, you know, what's the, the number? What's the average or whatever, you know, and young married couples in their 20s, it's two to four times a week. So that's every other day, something like that. Now, the older you get, you know, sometimes, um, you know, the numbers aren't quite as high, <laughs> but it doesn't mean the quality is not quite as high. So scripture says in Hebrews not to defraud one another in this arena, except for fasting and to give yourself to prayer for a short period of time so that you don't open up the door to the devil in temptation in that arena. And it says it's because really you're not your own when it comes to that arena. When you get married, you're committing to satisfy one another in that part of your life and not try to find satisfaction in that arena in someone else while you're married to this one right here. Are y'all following what I mean by this? So there should be a loyalty and a commitment and a satisfaction that's found uh, within one another. A wife cannot reject this need in her husband without rejecting him at the same time. And so I think that may be challenging for women to understand, you know, at times, which would be like, you know, that I'm not rejecting him. I just don't want to right now. And I don't want to tomorrow either. And I don't want to this week. And I don't want to next week. And I don't want to. And it sounds like well, we're just busy and we're all tired and I'm tired or we got a lot going on. We got kids and ball games and church and travel and we got all these things. You're not being uh, hyper spiritual in rejecting your husband's desire for physical intimacy with intimacy with you. It is a need of his that you are to meet. And it goes both ways. It's a need of hers that you are to meet. And the marriage bed is undefiled, meaning there, there should be enjoyment, pleasure, uh, respectfully, creativity, fun, all of that within the, the, the boundaries of that marriage bed. Uh, with no one else in there except the two of y'all. Amen. Are y'all still with me on this? Sex should draw him to you, not push him away. It should be something that draws him to you and to know that that's something that he can look to that need being met uh, by you and that he doesn't have to feel like I'm going to get rejected or I got to beg or how many days I got to beg before this need is met. 
are y'all with me in this? Doesn't mean it's ever okay for adultery or all the other things that sometimes people can make excuses. You know, men can make, well, she's this and she's that, so I'm going to go find it somewhere else. Doesn't mean that you get to have a lack of self-control. I mean, you need to understand that as a man, you know, even though that's a need that should be being met, if there's a season where there's sickness, there's um, stuff going on, uh, a new baby, there's certain things that are going on. It's like, that doesn't mean you get to, to not have self-control anymore and be like, no, I mean, consider what a single man should be demonstrating in his self-control. So if you're a married man and there's a season where there's challenge physically or challenge emotionally or things are going on, there should be a level of self-control and respect for her uh, that is that is given as well. Are y'all with me in this? So if you're a married couple, you're a Christian married couple, you should have a very healthy, vibrant, consistent sex life uh, with your spouse. People outside, you know, of the church or of, of Christianity shouldn't look at the examples of, of, of marriage within the church and think, wow, they, they're boring. They don't enjoy life. They don't da, da, da. We should have an enjoyable, flourishing, uh, pleasure filled sex life. Amen. So ladies, every now and then, you know, don't wear, you know, flannels to bed, you know, like don't, don't wear canvas to bed, cardboard, you know, it's like try try I mean to be like well I'm going to bed I mean this is our night together and you just like take all your makeup off and you put on the most whatever clothing like and here I am it's like well wait 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 you looked really nice about an hour ago give him the best you got okay so I'll just encourage you along this and then I'll move on women be more sexual than you feel okay and be creative and energetic about it. And even from time to time, even if you don't feel like it, be the one who initiates. <laughs> who said, did brother Greg say, come on? <laughs> Sorry, it was obvious. It was, he's just amening. He thought out loud. He said, come on, pastor Aaron, preach that word. So, and I don't, I'm not going to get on this, you know, I'll move on because I just got one more thing. But for, for men, you don't want uh, pornography. You don't want even what would be considered like reels, all the different stuff that can get really, it can get real nasty fast to be the thing that you're, you know, looking to or lusting after or whatever. Obviously that's not right before God. You want your spouse, your wife to be the one um, that you look to, desire, long for, and find fulfillment in. Amen. Um, we have a minister friend. I can't remember who exactly told us this, but I think it's just kind of how they taught in their church. And they said, most of the time, I won't say always because we've had situations the other way, but most of the time, because a man's sex drive is so much stronger than a woman's, it is mostly men being rejected in that area because that's how they take it. And so this minister said, you get to say no to sex, yeah. but you have 24 hours to make it up to them and you have to initiate it. Well, that'll make you more willing real quick. And he's like, if you'll be willing to live this way, it'll fix a lot right. of marriage problems. I don't, I hope this is not too much information, but one thing I found like a good meal and sex will fix about anything for a man. Bad day, upset, something gone. Is it right or wrong? Am I right on that? Men, raise your hand. Talk to me. We're family. It can okay. fix a lot of things. It, it can take care of a lot of business. It seems to be yeah. almost magic. Except it's not. I think really God made it that way. So you have 24 hours to make it right. If you're a Christian married couple and you haven't had sex in three months, unless there is physical or real, real other issues, 
something's wrong. Something's wrong in your marriage, you know, unless you're like, you know, I'm 90 and we're past that or, you know what I mean? It's like, no, no, you're 30, you're in your thirties, you're in your twenties, you're in your forties, you're in your fifties, you're 60. I mean, there should be something happening on a, on a regular basis. Don't even say three months. That's a long time, y'all. Three months, six, but it happens is what I'm saying. It happens. Um, so. And women, if you're okay going that long without sex, something is wrong. So you need to go get like a hormone panel or something. See, I'm serious. It could help you because that's not normal for a woman either. It shouldn't be. Amen. Amen. Number two for a, for a woman's needs. Let's move on. Number two, leadership. Uh, women do desire leadership and um, they don't, that doesn't mean they want to be dominated. They do want to be treated as your partner, as your equal but they want their husbands to be loving, please know that word, loving initiators of the home. And there's four areas we would love you to be loving initiators in the home when it comes to children, romance, finances, and spiritual matters. That means when the kids are acting crazy, it communicates love to me when you lead in making those jokers stop. I don't at all enjoy, I mean, our, our girls are out of the house now, but I, when it comes to the discipline, like you do it when you have to, but it just seems to work better when the dad steps in. And women really like that. And if there's ever a time when I'm having to like discipline and he's in the room again, it's a little personal, but there've been a few moments where I don't know if anything made me more angry in that moment is when I felt like he didn't have my back with the kids because I was like, oh, you're the good cop today, huh? That's how this is gonna go. I have to be the mean mom. Now they're gonna be like, our dad's so great and our mom is so mean, you know? And so what do we want? I want you to lead the way when it comes to like discipline with the children and, and that kind of arena. And then with romance, put a heart by the coffee pot, for goodness sake. I'm not like a huge flower person, but I do like it when he buys me flowers. But over the years, Aaron's learned like what communicates love to me, little romantic gestures. And I appreciate that when he does that. Again, we don't have to talk about it. I want you to lead the way financially. That means making good decisions when it comes to finances. And then when it comes to spiritual matters, um, they want you to lovingly lead the way. That means if you want a wife who loves Jesus and acts like how, how you know, oh, I want a Proverbs 31 woman, well, be a man of God. Men of God attract Proverbs 31 women. That That's how it works. Um, and sometimes you, you attract your your likeness. And so I would always say this, if you don't kind of like what you're attracting, then swap, you know, do something better, do a little growing. But we do want you to be the loving initiator in the home, even if you have a more passive personality. We want you to stand up and be the initiator. That means we want you to begin the conversations about discipline, about things with the children, uh, begin the conversation about budgeting, Be begin the conversation about a church and spiritual life and things like that. One thing Aaron's done over the years that I really appreciate is getting the kids together when they were younger on Saturdays. Well, Friday nights we've had, we would have family night, but Saturday, and he didn't wake us all up early, thank the Lord. But when we were all up, we'd have some sort of a Saturday brunch lunch, depending on the time, and we would have a devotion and Aaron would lead that up. And pretty often he'd say, do you want to say anything? And I'm like, nope. Why? Because I like that you're leading the way in that for my kids. I want my daughters to one day say, when I meet a man, I want him to be like my dad. I want a man who's not afraid to sit at a table and say, bring your Bibles. We're going to sit down for a while and do a devotion. I want a husband who's going to look at my daughters and say, this is how we deal with money. And this is how we deal with, with, you know, punishment. You did this wrong. These are the consequences. Women desire that. And here's just an added bonus. It's very attractive. It is very attractive when a man leads the way. Um, that's all I'll say about that. And we that. generally still do that. They're 20, 19, and 16. And when they're home from college, not every Saturday, but most will still have time where we do that. And like, let's have a talk. Let's sit down. Even if there's friends over, all the friends oh, yeah. are invited to the table. 
I liked when they had friends spend, spend the night or the hanging. I'm like, we're all having Devo together. Oh, but dad, I know they're here. They're eating our food. And we're all going to sit around and talk about Jesus for a few minutes. This is an outreach Saturday. We supply Bibles to all of them. We've got plenty. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else on that? Um, here's another uh, something that a, a man would desire, and this would be companionship companionship, someone that, um, that you can enjoy doing life with. And sometimes as you, as you're married for a while, you end up having your thing, you know, and they have their thing. Like she's like a, you know, if I'm going to play basketball on Monday night or I'm gonna, if I like to play golf, those are things she's probably not going to do with me. You know, she doesn't want to do that. That's okay. And it's okay to have those kinds of things that maybe you do separately from time to time, but there must be things that we enjoy doing together. There must be parts of our life that we are, we're making core positive memories together and we're doing that intentionally. So there's things that when our kids were younger, especially we would do date nights almost every Thursday night when we could, and we didn't have, you know, an overdose of church things or other things happening. And now that it's just Jude at the house, he's 16, we can kind of, you know, work our schedule however we kind of want. And we kind of do other things that are more extended. You know, we like music, we'll go to a concert. We'll, there's a movie we want to watch, if there's things we want to do together. But to have that kind of fun together, uh, Jimmy Evans, and he said this, and um, he's the one that's the founder of EXO and the marriage stuff that we'll be listening to on Friday night. But he said this, your husband will never open up more with you than when he is having fun with you. He's having fun, fun with you. And like I said, sometimes after you've been married for 10, 20, 30 years, you're like, well, we're past the fun. You shouldn't be past the fun. You should be enjoying life together. And if you stop and think back to the beginning when you dated or when you were engaged, you did fun things together. You know what I mean? It's like we enjoyed, you know, playing whatever board games or we just did, or we watched things that we enjoyed to watch together. Like I'm thinking even about like our daughter Avery has a boyfriend right now. And one of the things they, they play tennis and they do all these things. I'm watching their relationship. It's just kind of fun to watch a little bit from a far away because there's things, and he likes to do stuff all the time. He wants to do this. Let's go play pickleball. Let's go do this and others. And she likes all that, but you can kind of see it's like, man, it's a lot, you know, to do, but you can see the desire that uh, a man would have for that kind of fun or companionship. And it doesn't have to be, like I said, every single thing all the time, every day. You know, everybody can do their thing and have their space when they need it, but there has to be places where your life intersects and you enjoy, like we and she likes sports. That really works out well for me. It really does. Works out well for me because if I'm like, hey, a date night, we're going to go watch the Pelicans play in New Orleans. She's not like bummed out and like, don't spend the money on that. That's a waste. She's like, that's going to be fun. Let's go do that. Eat somewhere good too. Like, let's make a night of it and enjoy that. Or LSU or something like a ball game. She likes those things. So that works out. Well, that's a place where our, our life intersects. Maybe that's not the same for you. Um, but um, even looking for a spouse or a mate, there needs to be more than just physical attraction. There needs to be places where you enjoy life together. You enjoy talking or, you know, we talk, I, I listen to audiobooks all the time and I know she doesn't care about all of them. Um, I listen to podcasts all the time, but there's, there's times when we'll talk about those things and our life intersects right there. And I get to share things that I'm enjoying with her. And then she'll, we'll, you know, of course we'll talk about scripture and the word and all the things like that, but companionship, don't make your husband go look somewhere else for fun seven days a week. There's no fun with you. It needs to be like, let's have fun. Let's enjoy this. And, uh, you know, go to the axe throwing place here now. Like, you know, there's a new, what's it called? Axe, whatever. Um, it's fun. You know, go bowling, go top golf, go to Lafayette, go do something. You don't have to spend a thousand dollars to do it, but make memories that you, in, you are enjoying life together. Can I be honest with you? Life can be very hard. Marriage can be very challenging. 
every marriage will have bumps in the road and challenges along the way. And I think the same way about investing in our relationship with our kids. It's like we want to have core memories and positive things that we are intentional about making so that when we hit the bumps in the road, we're not running on empty. You know what I mean? It's like there's a lot of positive things that we've enjoyed together. So when we hit stuff, it's not like, well, our whole marriage sucks or our whole family sucks. It's like there's nothing ever good. It's like, no, 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 we've got a lot of positive things built in. So when we hit those hard parts, it's not like, oh, now we got nothing. It's like, it's okay. That's just, you know, that's a challenge that we're going to work through or we're going to talk through or deal with. And part of that companionship, we're having fun together is, is part of that. It's building into like filling up that, that part of your life where you enjoy that together. I mean, it didn't have to be, like I said, you can go fishing. You can take a walk in Kasachi National Forest together, talk about stuff, whatever. Any of those things that, that help you enjoy life together. I would say this too about companionship because I think sometimes we say no too quickly. Like if Aaron brings certain things up, I think you ha I have to at least be willing to give it a shot. Like if you know there's something your husband loves and you're a woman here like, I hate sports. Well, you know, sometimes I do things I don't want to do at all. Probably every day I do something I don't really want to do. But you know what I do want? I want to spend time with him. And I want him to know that I care about what he cares about. So there are some things I will do, not because it's my favorite thing in the whole world or I couldn't think of something better to do. It's because I'm, I want to be with him. And if you're willing to do get up and go to work every day, which I know most of you probably don't think that's your favorite thing all day, but you get up and go. Why? Because it's worth it when I get the paycheck. But it's worth investing into some things that he likes because he, he I know for a fact he does some things with me with great patience that he would not, he doesn't want to be doing them, but he will. And I know he's, he's not here because he loves this situation. He's here because he loves me. He's doing this because he cares about me. And so um, I just would say be willing to make your spouse your best friend, your companion, the person that if you could pick one person to do whatever with, I'm going to pick him. It, it'll just help a lot. Okay. The last thing for women, they want open and honest communication. For men, I, I'll sum it up this way. Um, we don't like headlines. Do you know what I mean? Like, how was your day? Great. How are you feeling? Fine. Anything wrong? Nope. I mean, we're not, what happens when you give us headlines is that we make up all the rest, rest of the text in our mind. And it might not, you might mean, I believe now. I, I used to not believe when we were first married. Now I believe when I say, what do you think about? And he says, nothing. Oh, I believe it now. <laughs> nothing. And he means it. And I've studied enough about it to scientifically know it's a possibility, ladies. They can literally be thinking nothing. Sometimes I'm trying to think about nothing. Like I'm working on nothing right now in the name of Jesus. And I'm never thinking about nothing. And, and so it's just different. So we don't want a headline. We don't want like a grunt. Uh, yeah. We just really want some words. And I don't like hearing, I don't know any women who like hearing the word nothing. What's going on? Nothing. Literally. Why? I don't know why we're like that. We're just like that. But I do know this, I connect to his world through communication. Like I want to hear about it. So when my, when, when I will say to him, what did you do today? I don't just want like an event. I want the feelings that were attached to the event. I know you hate that men, most of you, but if you could just work on like adding three words to it, how was today good? Because we had a great lunch. Even that's going to help. Why? Because we just want to be involved in your life. We just want to know that there is something going on with you because when you give us the yes, no answers, it feels like we know there's some things that went on today. You just don't want to tell us about it. So I wonder what really went on today because you don't want to tell me about it. And it, it just can cause a lot of issues. So, so you don't like it when like I respond with just the one letter K. K. No, don't like that. Yeah. 
You don't like that either. No. Not at all. Because y'all know why you do that. You good? Yep. I mean, that is the hugest no ever. Anyway, and this kind of is going to go back to when you were talking about sex a little bit, but let me, let me just explain it. If you want the secret to better sex with your wife, talk to her. Communicate with her. Give her a hug that's only a hug, where your hands only hug her back. I mean, it's fine to do the other hug some, stop it. It's fine to do the other hug sometimes. So challenging. Because most women, I mean, it's like a high percentage of women find intimate conversation very stimulating sexually. Talking to you makes them want to have sex with you more, unless you're being a jerk, you know what I mean. But just like actual conversation about the day makes my heart open to you more. And what it has to do with, with sex is this, is that for women, great sex begins with her life as a whole, not just, when men like one dimensionalize women, it's like objectifying your wives. And I don't wanna be offensive, but that's what pornography is. You look at a woman as body parts, no spirit, no soul. So you know what I don't ever wanna feel like in a marriage? A body. So when you talk to me, when you communicate with me, when you ask me about my life, that makes me much more willing to say I want to be intimate with this person because my heart is now open to you. And this is, this is why sex for the Christian marriage is so much different than the world. It is not one dimensional for the Christian. And when you begin to openly communicate, you will find that the more you're willing to talk to your wife, the more open she will be with you on in all areas of life. The more you're gonna find that companionship, the more you're gonna find deeper intimacy, the more you're gonna find better sex, and she'll be, she'll be better at it, I'm telling you, when you're willing to do that. Why? Again, this is the really old, but because women have spaghetti brains and men have waffle brains. What does that mean? If you have a waffle and you pour syrup in it, you know what it does? It settles into every little waffle square. But you ever see a plate of spaghetti that's settled? You pick up one noodle, how many come up? All of them. Men, you wanna know what's going on in a woman's life? When you say, how was your day? You're picking up a fork full of spaghetti. When you ask your man, <laughs> how was your day? And he says, good, cause the work square was good. You know what he's not thinking about when you ask him about work? Anything else, why? One waffle square. <laughs> you ask the woman, how was work? Well, could you believe? And by the time it's over, we're not talking about work, but in her brain, spaghetti fork. It's all connected. If you're willing to listen to my spaghetti talk, I'm much more willing to want to be close with you because we can't help it. I try. Sometimes I think to myself, give him the more compact version. And I think I'm better at that now. And now, and I know he's worked real hard at being a lot more communicative with me. And sometimes I'm like, you don't have to do that right now. I'm tired. And he's like, thank you. <laughs> uh, why though? Because we've really worked at it. But be open, be honest with your communication. If your wife asks you, how was your day and it was bad? Do you know what? We want you to tell us about it. We know men naturally are fixers and they don't want to you don't often want to share because you're like, I want to fix it. I don't want to seem weak or vulnerable like I had a bad day. You know what we love? When you tell us you had a bad day. Why? Because we want to take care of you. We want to be able to say, well, I'm sorry your day was like that. Tomorrow's going to be a better day. It's going to, it does better for both parties. So just be very open. Be very honest in your communication. Women, when men are vulnerable and honest with you, don't correct them. When Aaron's being honest about something, even if I'm like, why would he ever think that was okay? You know what I don't want to say in that moment? Why would you ever think that was okay? Because why? He's sharing with me. He's telling me something he's not telling other people. And you know what he wants? He wants me to respect it. He wants me to understand it. He wants me to listen. 
I don't have to fix it. I don't have to try to mother him out of it. Just listen. Say tomorrow's going to be better. Because it, it really will, that kind of communication will just give you roots in your marriage that you really are going to need when the storms of life come. So, Well, part of that is because if, if a man's opening his heart to you and you correct or shame or shut him down, he's going to remember that next time. And the next time he's going to be like, the last time I did that, she corrected, shamed, or shut me down. I'm not going to tell her. And that's, and that's, and a lot of times, um, the man will go silent yep. and then stay silent for months, yep. years, or for the rest of the marriage. And so that's, that's dangerous, honestly. Um, but what I would like to say is like, um, when you're communicating, when you're talking, um, and now after all these years, you know, for a man or for myself to actually still desire to hear what she has to say genuinely. And, um, and so for a lot of guys, they're scared of that. They're like, I don't want to ask her how she's feeling because that means she's got to say everything. I don't really want to know. I'd rather just like this to be as concise and short as possible. But it's, you're missing out on so much uh, of who she is and what she's got within her that she really wants to share with you. And then we've had times where, you know, she, she's talking to me about something. I'm like, man, this is intense. <laughs> this is heavy. This is a lot. That's what, and I know she, she's, she can see it on my face. Like, oh, yeah, I know it's a lot. And then she'll, she said these words, you know, like, who else do you want me to share this with? Yeah. Like, who else should I be able to talk to about this? And I'm thinking, yeah, I, this needs to, this is going to help us to be close yeah. and stay close that we have that kind of intimacy um, where I know where you're at and I hear your heart and, um, and I want it. I want that. So men, don't be afraid. You know, don't be afraid of her opening up or, and then don't go straight into automatic. Cause I, she said, guys like to fix it. You know, don't go straight into, cause I used to do this. Like she'd be saying something and I just cut her off and be like, let's do these three things. She's like, well, we need to, she's like, I'm going through this. I feel this. I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to do dun, 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 dun. I'm like, I'm shutting her down. And really, she may not even really want Mr. Fix It at all. She just wants someone who listens to her and is with her and will have her back, whatever needs to happen moving forward. Am I right with that? Yeah, I think women too by nature are fixers. They're very maternal. They want to make things better. But honestly, sometimes, here's the truth. I already know how I could get myself out of this situation, how it can be fixed. I, I, some, most of the time I already know, like, I have a pretty good grip on the word and what God would say and how to work past this. So it's not always about me looking. I don't want an answer. I just want to tell you about it. Because again, who else am I going to tell? And I've already prayed about it. I've already talked to Jesus. And now I just, I want somebody there. Sometimes I'm looking for a perspective that's not mine because I already know my perspective. But maybe you can offer me something, but I'm, I'm not asking you to fix it because sometimes in that vulnerable moment, it seems like you're trying to fix me. And I don't want to come to you as a person looking for you to like fix me. I want to come to you as a partner in life. The person I can share things with and know it's safe to share with you. And even if you think I'm wrong, just say, tomorrow will be better. Save the other stuff for another time. And then sometimes you'll find you don't need to say it at all. Yeah. So there's probably, you know, more core needs or essentials, you know, and there's some other things we'll cover next week. Um, but those are, are pretty key, I think. Um, if, and if you can get those right, you can, you can knock a lot of things out of the park. Yeah just working on that. And that gives you a lot to work on for the rest of your marriage, if I'm honest with you. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're a man and you're like, man, so we really got to talk that much. That's how much I'm going to talk. If you're single, you know, like, I don't know if I want to get married. I don't want to have those kind of, then don't get married. <laughs> you know, I was getting, uh, I was getting a haircut one time and this lady was cutting my hair and she said, uh, what are you? And I was texting my wife. I said, I'm texting my wife, letting her know where I'm at, what I'm doing. Da, 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 da. She said, wow, you really got to check in all the time. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm just communicating. She's my wife. You know, I'm just letting her know where I'm at, what I'm doing. She goes, man, I would never want to have to tell somebody where I'm at, what I'm doing all the time. Who is she? No, this is, 
not a current, no one that cuts my hair current years ago. And make a little visit. Yeah, no, I said, I said, then don't ever get married. Right. That's what I told her. Don't get married because if you don't want accountability, right. then what are you, what are you running from? You don't, don't get married. You're going to, there's going to be a lot of accountability with everything. And it's probably one of the great refiners of your life right. to get married and have to let go of some of your selfish ways. Yeah. Well, Amen. Praise the Lord. So um, there's nothing that will kill selfishness more than two things. One, marriage. Two, having children. <laughs> and th then you realize as a married couple how selfish you are as a married couple. Because yeah. you do whatever you want whenever you want. Then you have kids and you're like, well, doggone it. <laughs> we got we to gotta work around this child. And then you have two or three of them and you're like, what did we do? Like, why did we do this? <laughs> what, what has happened to our life? I'll see you in 20 years, you know. So, <laughs> we're on the home stretch, though. We're on the home stretch. So um, I want to read this one scripture to you because it'll help you. And I've, I've shared it with you before, just concerning wisdom and understanding. And scripture says uh, in 1 Kings 4, 29, that God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding uh, and great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. That's 1 Kings 4, 29. God gave Solomon wisdom an exceedingly great understanding. And concerning every arena of your life, you can believe God for that, ask him for that. But concerning your marriage, your family, you can say, Lord, I'm asking you for wisdom and exceeding great understanding uh, for my spouse or for my marriage or for my, my, my family. Amen.